Hey, this is episode 93, Pain Points of Wealth. And we've heard a lot about recession, but it seems like the economy is more resilient, probably the right R word you should be using right now, as we've seen a labor market that's the hottest in 50 years. We've never seen a recession when unemployment was going down, and that's what we see today. We're seeing inflation numbers start to come down, as we told you on this show. So what does it mean for the rest of the year? Are we going to get this recession? Or are we still in an economic boom? What do you make of it? Well, we're going to get into that today. And on the tipping point today, we're going to talk about how your financial independence plan is like putting together a jigsaw puzzle. So we're going to help you just frame it, visualize it, show you how to get financially independent as soon as possible. Check it out. We got a great show. guys, you know what I love about our industry? We have to have titles for everything, right? We had a bear market. Now the NASDAQ has rallied 20% off its recent low. So now the NASDAQ's in a bull market. Uh, so I don't get it. Is the glass half empty? Is the glass half full? Are we in a recession? Or is it? are you right about this, right? Is it an economic, resilient economy? Well, Bob, you know, I like to think I'm usually right. Some people might disagree with that. Uh, But in my mind, you know, I always get it right. But no, it's a good point because now it's like, well, is this rally for real? Is it a bull market or is it a dead cap bounce? And we like to use animals all the time on Wall Street. There's there's this love love of animals. Well, they obviously don't love cats because it's dead. (laughs) It's true. It's true. Why not? Why all the hate for cats on Wall Street? That could be a whole podcast. I don't know. (laughs) But, you know, but I think the bottom line here is. Look, I mean, we always talk about this, like the counter view is probably the right view. You know, you've heard a lot of economists and strategists been very, very dour on the state of the economy this year, state of the stock market and profits. And what we've seen is just resilience. And I think, you know, when you're making a bet, I don't want to call it a bet, but you're invested in in stocks and you're invested in in the markets, you're really investing in the belief that human nature is going to figure it out regardless of what's thrown at us. And I think that's what you're seeing right now. We had high inflation. But employment's still strong. Companies are still figuring out ways to navigate around that inflation. And really, that's that's human nature, right? That's a bet on human nature. And it's hard to bet against human nature long term. And these economists and strategists love to bet against human nature. It's kind of messed up. You know, Ryan, you always say that the surprises always come in the positive. And uh, I was talking to a client of mine back in June. And one of the things we had talked about was that half the return comes from income, interest, and dividends. And their big concern was like, well, you know, if the market's going into recession, you know, we're not going to get as much income and go figure over the past month, earnings have come in at 5.8% better than what was expected. They really did, Chris. And 77% of companies reported better than expected profits. Now, that comes with a caveat, right? Because during the course of the quarter, companies will start to ratchet down their expectations, right? It's, it's, It's amazing how it seems like every quarter companies are able to beat the expectation, you know, from analysts. And as we all know, analysts are actually pretty lazy, they don't really change anything until the stock already goes down or the negative news comes out. But the fact is, you know, companies are profitable, right? We have an economy that's still growing, even though we had a negative GDP number. You know, we had a uh, we have an economy that's slowing and inflation is still raging. But, you know, we had two good inflation numbers this week that brought inflation down from last month's readings. So maybe we have peak inflation. Maybe we have peak uh, hawkishness on the part of the Federal Reserve, and it's time to start thinking about all the positive news that's going to be coming out going forward. Yeah, and that's really where markets trade, right? It's, it's that gap between what the expectations are and what reality actually ends up being. And I think that's what we saw this last week with inflation is expectations where inflation was going to be higher. Now, what reality is telling you is, well, it's not as bad as you think. It is starting to slow. And this is something, you know, our podcast, we've been identifying with commodity prices coming down. You know, oil prices have come down significantly from the highs. And I think what the interest rate market is telling you, right, the 10-year Treasury, as we're recording this, is only around 2.8%. That's not pricing in 8% inflation going out into the future. And I think that's important. You know, the market's always forward-looking. The market's always right. Um, and I, I heard a lot of economists and strategists say this. Well, the market's not, they're not really, 
getting how high inflation really is. The market doesn't really understand. No, no, you're wrong. The market's right. <laughs> you know, it's, if the market's going up, the market's telling you that you know, inflation is coming down, it's moderating, and the economy is probably stronger than what we've been hearing out there. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like the uh, old math classes, arithmetic, arithmetic classes you had back in grade school. You, know, you put two plus two equals five, you were wrong, right? So when it comes to the market, you can have your opinion, you can have your belief, but the market is always right. And I love it when these analysts come out and say, wow, the market just doesn't understand. Um, how about you don't understand <laughs> how that the market is always right because it's millions of people making decisions based on inside information. That's legal inside information. Um, but people are making decisions based on what's in front of them. So again, you have to believe your lying eyes or you got to believe the market. And uh, the market's telling us that things are a lot better than what the media has been telling us. It reminds me of the old saying, I'd rather be uh, rich than right. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, at the bottom line, it's right. The market's always right. And I think it's interesting, too, because you could point, Bob, like if you're working in a company, right, you do have some sort of inside information because you know if the sales are strong or weak. And what do insiders do? They're going to buy their stock or they're going to sell their stock based on what they see internally, even if it's not, quote, unquote, inside information. So the market typically is ahead of what the information finally is that we get, as it, or even Wall Street gets, because when you're inside that company, you're, you're well ahead of where the markets are. Well, you know, we have the Federal Reserve, which is going to increase interest rates again at their next meeting. Now, there's no meeting this month, so we get a reprieve. Um, but our expectations are another 75 basis point hike. And now some people are thinking maybe it'll only be 50 or even 25 basis points. But you can't go by what the Fed tells you, right? They told us that inflation was transitory. Now they tell us we're going to fight inflation. Um, but now there's a lot of pundits and a lot of analysts, a lot of strategists that believe that if the economy slows down, then the Fed will be actually cutting interest rates this time next year. So it's better to stay invested. It's better to have a diversified portfolio where you're generating income that you can take that money. For example, next week we have all our pipeline dividends coming in where we can take advantage of this volatility and buy things while they're on sale. I don't know about you guys. I love buying on sale. Always better at a discount, Dad. Very better at a discount. You're right. And Bob, I'm glad you mentioned diversification. Because again, we look at like 50 portfolios a month, and what we're finding is most of you are not diversified. And I think it's tricky right now because we've had this magnificent bounce since the middle of June. It caught everyone off guard. Maybe it didn't catch us off of guard. We've been pretty optimistic every week for the record. So, you know, make a note of that. But, you know, the point is it's been the growth in those tech stocks that have been leading the rally here. And what tends to happen is we see a lot of money plowing back into that trade, right? Because it's like, well, I saw my tech stocks go down. I'm going to wait for that bounce. And that's like not the right decision to make here, in my opinion. You want to start to spread the money out because when you have volatility like we've had, and we've had you know, a lot of volatility and a bear market technically, is the leadership tends to change. So I think it's really important right now that people do spread their money out. They don't just go back into that tech trade because I think they're going to be disappointed, especially with the higher interest rates and the higher inflation that we're probably going to see the next couple of years. Well, you know, that's a really good point, Ryan. I actually just did an analysis of a portfolio last, just last week. And believe it or not, the portfolio at the competing, competing firm was like almost entirely in big tech stocks. Well, Chris, that's a good point. You know, when you have past performance, it's 100 percent predictive of past performance. That's about all it can tell you. You know, it doesn't tell you anything about the future. And what happens a lot of times when you have this volatility, when you have a bear market, leadership does change. Now, one of the things that occurred in this market is tech got way overvalued, right? Large cap growth stocks were trading at 38 times forward earnings. They're down to like 21 times forward earnings now. Meanwhile, the rest of the world was cheap and got cheaper. So you have international stocks selling at 11 times forward earnings. You have value stocks, like small cap value, which has been the best performing asset class in history, is only trading at about 10 times forward earnings. So what happens is you have you know, opportunities in the market that exist and stay existent, and you just have to take advantage of it. So it's really about diversification. I wouldn't get, you know, and I, th I think that you still need to own growth in your portfolio because we don't know what's going to outperform next. Uh, I know something will, and I know we'll own it, but uh, you got to make sure you're diversified. That's the key. Yeah, and look, look, history teaches us everything, right? And we saw when the tech bubble burst, we saw technology stocks had this magnificent sell-off. I think statistically it was like 70% of stocks in the NASDAQ were down over 50%. But then you had a magnificent rally, and these stocks went up 30%. It was like a new bull market. 
only to go down another 80% after it went up 30%. So the point is here, you don't want to get sucked into that growth trap. This could very well be a growth trap where you know you see a lot of money funnel back in, like we're seeing that with Bitcoin right now. A lot of these disruptive technologies are taking money in again, but that could just be lining up for another bigger fall later. You know, meanwhile, Bob, like we've talked about this every week, like when you come out of a recession, small caps are a great place to be, which they're having a bigger rally than the overall market. And international markets, what if the dollar weakens, which is starting to do? It's starting to do. What if the war in Ukraine goes away? Well, you know, Ra, you, you, you're being too optimistic. You know, that's, that's what I hate about <laughs> you. You're always so optimistic. Um, you know, and, and this is what I love, you know, because it, it, clients will call and they'll say, well, how can things be going up when things are so bad, right? I mean, so bad, right? We were at 37,000 beginning of this year. We're at 33,000 now. You know when things were really bad? It was in 2020 when the Dow dropped to 18,000. That, that was two years ago. Look how much progress we've made. And, you know, you forget about, you know, the, where the markets have been, where we're coming from, because we're so myopic when it comes to our portfolios, it comes to the economy. You got the media in our face telling you all the things that are horrible and all the headwinds. Well, a lot of these headwinds, are going to turn into tailwinds, uh, you know, in the future. So you got to be prepared, you know, for the market to move higher. And, you know, you got to kind of eliminate the noise, as we tell everybody every week. All that stuff is noise. You know, over time, markets go higher. And the key to success, the key to wealth creation is compounding of your dividends and interest. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 93, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. This is what Bob, Chris, and I have done now for literally a collective 75 years. We've been doing this for a long time. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you want to get a full analysis of what you're doing right now and you have over a million dollars saved, Bob, Chris, and I will run for your total financial master plan. We'll do it with no obligation or cost. There's no other firm out there that will do this for free. We will go through every investment you own. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal to get a bird's-eye view of literally your entire financial picture, and we'll hone in on every financial issue that you have. We're going to look at every investment you own, the fees you're paying, the hidden costs, and those annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, show you how to reduce the cost on your portfolio and optimize it for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. We're going to give you our full tax playbook to save on taxes. We're going to look at an income plan. How are you going to live off your portfolio when you're finally financially independent? We're going to put together a full plan that factors in inflation, what you need to live on, and we're going to look at diversification. Is your money over-concentrated in the wrong areas? Do you have the proper protection for your portfolio if the market sells off? Or are you sitting with cash, paralysis by analysis, trying to figure out what to do but can't figure out what to do? We're going to give you a full investment game plan, show you how to grow your money, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. If you have over a million dollars saved for retirement, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, you know, we probably see more volume than most firms out there with the billion dollars that we manage or advise on. Um, we literally look at probably 50 portfolios a month. Uh, so we know what every strategy out there on Wall Street looks like. And we found that most of you don't really have a financial independence plan. So I thought we could talk today about like when you have a jigsaw puzzle, how that's very, very comparable to what it's like to build the right financial independence plan so that you can create financial security and eventually you can live off your assets and really be dependent on what you've saved over the years. Yeah, you're talking about jigsaw puzzles, right? The only time I look at a jigsaw puzzle is when it's raining at the beach. Um, and it drives me crazy. You throw those pieces on the table and just think if somebody throws away the, the, the cover to the box, you have no idea what that picture is supposed to look like. Trying to put those pieces together is near impossible. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of people do their financial planning. And add in a couple uh, couple scotches and you're really in trouble <laughs> on those rainy days. Just saying. Uh, that always brings things into focus for me. <laughs> I think that's the reason why a lot of people avoid putting together a financial plan because they have a collection of investments. They've got accounts every which way and they just don't know how to go about it, uh, that could be pretty overwhelming for people, I think. Yeah, it really can. And that's why you need to have that box, to Bob's you know, point, to like really get the view of what you're doing. And I think that's where we, we get it wrong. We put the cart before the horse. And we always say, like, you know, an old saying is, begin with the end in mind, which sounds very like Zen, sounds like something very spiritual. 
but it's really just painting that picture. And when we don't take the time to sit down and do that, and that's why our portfolio just like, like a, it's chaos, right? You have investments everywhere. You're sitting on too much cash. You don't know how everyone's, every, every portfolio is managed at different places. And it's just like a hodgepodge uh, of different strategies. So you, know, you, you can't really get it all together to start painting that picture of when do you want to be financially independent? How much money are you going to need to live on? And just going through that whole exercise is so therapeutic and it really puts everything into focus. Well, that's the whole idea. If you don't have that framework and, you know, a lot of clients always ask you, say, Bob, how do you know what to invest in? You know, when my dividends come in, when I give you new money, it's all about relative performance and, and how things are balanced, you know, relative to the rest of your portfolio. So if you don't have that context. It's really hard to know. And, and, you know, last I checked every market, every market in history reverts to the mean. So when something gets way out of whack, something gets way out of overvalued or undervalued, it's so obvious. It's like the nose on your face. But if you don't have an overall plan, you don't have a disciplined strategy, you're not diversified, you know, you're just you know, throwing darts at the board. Um, unless I check, monkeys do better than us at throwing darts at the board. Well, you know, speaking of monkeys throwing darts at a board, Dad, you know, I think you're more likely to get monkey pox than a successful investment portfolio taking that strategy. But, <laughs> you know, I was helping a client of mine the other day pick out their 401k investments. And it's like, you know, it's, it, it's impossible for the average person to pick the right investment when you have funds that have names like the Columbia Threadneedle Multi-Managed Alternative Fund. It's like, what the heck does that mean? You know, you can't Sounds expect- Sounds pretty awesome. Yeah. And, you know, it's full of it. not only great names, but a lot of fees, too. Well, that's a good point, Chris, because you have to manage everything in concert with everything else. You know, it's kind of like having all your money in your suit, right? You have, you know, some money in your top pocket, in your, in your back pocket. Um, it's all your money, but you have to look in the context of an overall strategy. Um, and you have to balance your 401k, you know, in concert with all your other other dollars. And, and that's a mistake a lot of folks make. They they try and manage each bucket separately uh, without, you know, recognizing that there may be more risk in the portfolio because you're overweight the same thing right across the board. And the problem I have with these mutual funds that are out there is those titles don't tell you anything, right? I mean, you don't know that you may end up with five or six different mutual funds with different names, but they own all the same underlying stocks. And if that stock happens to be like Zoom, um, or Roku, or one of these stocks that dropped 80% this year, it's not a very good year so far. No, it's not. And I think it goes back to like this jigsaw puzzle. Like you, you, you paint the picture, you look at what the actual, what, what you're trying to accomplish, right? What does the picture have to be? And then you build that framework around it, right? You, you, that's when you take, you try to build out, when I do a jigsaw puzzle anyway, I try to get the corners done first, right? So you can fill in the inside. And that's just like assessing, okay, what incomes do I have coming in? Um, and then start to assess like, you know, what different assets do I have? And it's kind of like, you know, when you, you put the colors together and you try to put the like pieces together, it's the same thing. Like, what are my retirement accounts? What's my 401k IRA and put them in one category. Then you put your brokerage accounts, your savings account, maybe your account at Morgan Stanley, hopefully not at Morgan Stanley, only joking, um, at Merrill Lynch and all those different places. And you start to categorize everything and organize it. So then everything can start to fit together. And, and these are the steps you have to take. And most of us, we just don't do it. Well, you know, when it comes to investing, guys, there are no good investments. There are no bad investments. The only kind there are are appropriate investments. And the beauty of a financial plan, which is different than a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, jigsaw puzzle, every piece has to fit perfectly or it doesn't work, right? You can't force those pieces in, even though I try to do that sometimes. When it comes to a financial plan, when it comes to your portfolio, the beauty of it is you only have to be approximately correct to achieve your goals. You don't have to be perfect. So don't sit there trying to be perfect. All you have to do is be approximately correct, and you're set for life. Well, that's, that's a great point. I think that's a big mentality, especially when it comes to investing that we always see. It's like being 100% right about something, which is crazy, right? Because when it comes to the markets, the economy, there's just so many different variables. And I think the financial media is the worst at this. Because it's like if you have this one indicator, and I'll give you an example of that. They love to talk about the inverted yield curve. <laughs> and they're always like, well, the inverted yield curve, because lower, shorter-term interest rates are higher than longer-term interest rates, well, it's predicted every recession in the post-World War II era. Well, sometimes that can be three years away. <laughs> you know, it's, it's not that helpful. So to predicate everything, your investment strategy or your, your retirement strategy on one or two variables is crazy. Because to your point, Bob, like, the difference between 100% right is 100% wrong, and you don't need to be that accurate. 
when it comes to good financial planning. You just have to be in the right, you know, in the right ballpark. Right. I don't think those analysts are wrong. I think they're just early. <laughs> I think you got to get a little more credit than that. I think someday we're going to go into recession. I'm, I'm just feeling very confident about that. <laughs> hey, Chris, it all comes down to one thing. You know, Ryan's often wrong, but he's never in doubt. Exactly. Well, you know, I think the most important thing when it comes to, to doing your financial plan is have the end game in mind. Because, you know, a lot of times I get a call from clients, especially times right now where there's a lot of fear and uncertainty out there saying, Chris, like, what do we have to change about the portfolio to make this better? And my question's always the same. I'm like, what about your financial plan has changed that is predicating us making changes to the portfolio? And usually the answer is never. And that should be the only reason you should be making changes to your, to your portfolios if, you're, if your financial plan changes. Right. Market conditions can change, but as long as your, your financial plan is intact and we know where you're going, then stick to the plan, right? That's what it's all about. And that's where it's like, can be very, very haphazard when you have like, Several different advisors giving you different advice. Pick one plan, pick one advisor, and stick to the strategy, right? Because there's a lot of way to cut a cake. I think that's the other thing to be fair about is we love our process. We think it's the best, but I think it's important you follow one strategy, one set of beliefs. But when you have lots of cooks in the kitchen, you're getting lots of different, a lot of times conflicting advice, you're going to end up with a, with a plan that's just going to be a failure. And I think that's one of the big mistakes that a lot of us make when we're trying to get to that path to financial independence. Well, it kind of reminds me when I go out sailing, you know, when you get out in the water, the, the sea conditions change. And every time the sea conditions change, I don't turn the boat around, go back in shore and make changes to the boat. I have stuff on the boat that I can change. I can change the sails. I can adjust the way the sail hits the wind. I can slow the boat down. I can speed it up. And, you know, that usually gets to my destination. But if you keep going back to port and you keep making changes back in port, you're not going to get anywhere. Well, it all comes down to one thing, guys. No one, I mean, no one listening to us right now or in the future plans to fail, but a lot of people fail to plan. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 93, Pain Points of Wealth. We have over 100,000 downloads. Your support's been amazing. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, give us that five-star ratings on iTunes. Give us the subscribe on Spotify. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you can like this actual video. You can subscribe and click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. Anyone you think can benefit from our content, please pass our podcast along. We're trying to grow our listenership. The more people listen, the more we can do this podcast. And if you have any comments, questions, leave them for us on our Instagram account. You can see Bob's sage wisdom there and see that his hair is real. Go to our Instagram, check us out, and give us some comments on what you want to hear about on Pain Points of Wealth. All right, gentlemen, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, it's hard to overstate the importance of Taiwan to the U.S. and the global tech landscape. Most of the advanced chips required for military defense systems and corporate computing services are made in, Ta in Taiwan. Taiwan accounts for more than 90% of the world's most advanced chip manufacturing to put it in perspective, South Korea is number two with just 8%. Well, it's uh, going to be a problem when China takes over Taiwan that we're not going to have any semiconductors. Now I'm afraid. Well, it just goes to show you how the economy and how markets work, right? We had a shortage of semiconductors. Uh, how many companies have just announced that they're spending hundreds of billions of dollars to build new factories to produce more chips, right? It's like it's what the U.S. economy has always been about. It's like find a need and fill it. That's what the economy is about. That's what corporate America is about. And that's why every excess is temporary and the markets adjust. And this is just another example of what's happening out there in a global economy. Yeah, and you're seeing more reshoring, which is going to take a couple of years. But clearly, our dependence on Taiwan needs to change because, as the Germans know, when you're too dependent on one provider for anything, in that case, natural gas and oil, it can be very, very problematic down the line. All right, Chris, cell phones are also making their way into younger hands. Last year, 43% of 8 to 12-year-olds had their own handsets. That's up from 24% in 2015. Are we just going to get like a microchip in our brain soon enough? Like it just seems like technology is taking over everything. I think that's where it's going. And, uh, you know, our, our nephew and, and, dad, and Bob's grandson, Liam, uh, one of his favorite toys is his little pretend cell phone. So I wouldn't be surprised and three or four years if Liam's going to be texting us on a regular basis. Maybe we'll just be like sending messages back and forth by like brainwaves by then. Who knows? It's really far out, right? Bob, do you remember the $6 million man? Oh, yeah. Well, the $6 million man toy from 1977, because of inflation, today would be called the $24 million man. Wow. Well, right, you know, it just goes to show that inflation is real, right? When you look at inflation, whether it's at 1% or 8.5%, 
which is what they're telling us now based on the CPI. Inflation is that hidden insidious tax, which is the biggest risk to everybody's financial net worth. That's the biggest risk you have in your financial plan is inflation. And that's why it's so critical to be certain that you have inflation hedges in your portfolio. The number one best inflation hedge in history is U.S. equities. Yeah, well, I should have put the stat in there what $6 million in U.S. equities would be today. Next time. All right, Chris. There are three things that matter in property. Location, location, location. Those are the words from Harold Samuel, a British real estate mogul from the 1900s. Well, Monaco is the most expensive city in the world. A million dollars only buys you 157 square feet of prime property. Wow, that's expensive. Well, it just goes to show you that when there's a scarcity of goods and a lot of dollars chasing those goods, that pushes the price up pretty high. Well, to put in perspective, too, Monaco is such a small uh, land area. It's actually only 0.78 square miles. To put that in context, New York Central Park is actually 1.31 square miles. So it's a very, very tiny piece of land with a lot, a lot of really rich people and a lot of yachts. I've been there. It's pretty wild. Hey, another great show today. Thanks for listening. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. Subscribe on Spotify. If you're watching this on YouTube, give us a like. You can subscribe to our channel and click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.